morning, everyone. I think we're, we're going to be starting again. And uh, I'm going to be the one to introduce my dad because um, growing up in this area where there, uh, a lot of us either, we, some of us either may work for agencies, government entities around here, but I happen to have the luck to grow up um, in a household where my dad had an enormous set of lock picks. And when I'd lock myself out of my car, I, I wouldn't call a locksmith, I'd call my dad. And uh, anywhere except DC, back then it was illegal to have lock picks or use lock picks in DC if you weren't a locksmith or law enforcement. But um, my dad taught me a lot about what I know, interests in um, breaking into things, to figure out how things work so other people can't break into them and to engineer them in a better way. My dad it was a, an operative with um, the CIA back way back in the 70s, 80s, uh, who knows, but um, he, he'll probably be able to tell you more about that. But I want to introduce my dad. He's going to be talking about the convergence of information technology and information security. We have a bit of a gap right now. So while we'll have, um, he'll, he'll describe it better, but while we have some access control physical security that are in facilities, the computer security hasn't, the two aren't meeting and they really need to for better security. And he's going to talk to you about that. Um, he gave this presentation at uh, Hackers on Planet Earth last summer. So I'm sure the slides have been updated since then, but I'm really glad that uh, my dad's going to be a presence in this hacker space here at Reverse Space. We're setting up a kind of like a live test bed in here for some projects we're working on. We're going to learn how some cameras work in here. We're going to learn how to beat them, how to design them better, and uh, that's going to be going on here in Reverse Space um, under my dad's guidance. So if you want to come in and test your skills in not only picking locks, but um, seeing how some cameras work and how they don't work. Um, he will uh, be leading up some projects on that. But without further ado, this is my father, John Strauss. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate it. Looking forward to this. Uh, I'm bored by seminars myself, so I don't have anything uh, set. So if you want to interrupt or challenge something I'm saying or uh, whatever, interrupt at any time. It doesn't bother me one iota. Also, I don't know what uh, the makeup is. It, everybody who's not undercover, raise your hand. <laughs> well, it's only three hands. What is that? Yes. <laughs> so I'm going to be talking about security and IT convergence. That's me. I work locally. And again, when I go to seminars, I like to know who's talking at me because I evaluate what they're saying. Um, I owned and operated a professional engineering firm for about 24 years. We specialized exclusively in security and fire systems. Prior to that, uh, I was uh, principal for security engineering for Gage Babcock and Associates. And prior to that, I was uh, operations officer, intelligence officer with the CIA. Well, that was that was an eternity ago. Why should we care about convergence? And by the way, for those who are interested, uh, Gates never met Hoover. That's photoshopped. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a, it's a terrific quote. In many respects, the physical information security groups that coexist within organizations are as different as J. Edgar Hoover and Bill Gates. And that is the heart of the problem. And you're going to hear this repeated theme for the next 45, 50 minutes, and that is IT community. By the way, everybody here is an exception to what I'm saying. Everybody's, you're covered. But the IT community is not very good at security, but they think they are. And the security community is horrible at IT. And a few think they, they're not. That's the heart of what I'm talking about. But let's talk a little bit about nomenclature, just for a minute, because it bothers me. <clears throat> the problem is that the IT community calls what I do physical security. <laughs> it bothers me. I go along with it. I mean, I'll, I'll, I can handle it. But to me, a security system is made up of three parts. Physical. Physical security to me is barriers, lighting, locks, roadways, stuff like that. Electronic is intrusion sensors, closed circuit television, access control, screening, things like that. And then there's an operational part, guards, procedures, management, SOPs, things like that. It's those three elements together that make a system. 
You go out and you buy a couple million dollars in hardware and gadgets, you don't have a system. You just simply have a truckload of hardware and gadgets. So anyway, from now on, when I say security, I'm not going to use the word physical security. But I'm talking about systems, all three. And, and, and by the way, the importance of, these, of the three varies all the time depending on the application. Sometimes the most important part is operational, sometimes electronic, sometimes physical. So that's my nomenclature. So why should we care about convergence? The effectiveness of both cybersecurity and cyber warfare, and that's something that we're all very, very interested in right now, particularly as a nation. Uh, we're, I don't think it's, it's a secret that we're relatively unprepared right now, particularly for cyber warfare. It's linked to the positive negative aspects of IT and security convergence. IT and security have a symbiotic relationship that has benefits and has liabilities. Why is it critically important to understand how convergence occurs? Because convergence is creating overlooked or ignored vulnerabilities, both in the IT community side and in the physical security side. Convergence is everywhere. Shepherds. <laughs> it, last year I did a uh, questionnaire survey in conjunction with American Society for Industrial Security, ASIS, and Security Management Magazine. That's their journal. And we surveyed 100 large corporations. Why large ones? Because Smaller corporations may not have a security department, may not have an IT department. But we wanted to see what's it like right now? How much convergence has already occurred? Just so you know, the average of the 100 companies came out to annual revenues of 3.8 billion, which means good sized company, 11,000 employees, IT department with 207 people. Security department, 341 people, which, by the way, probably includes contract services. And a security budget of a little over five and a half million dollars. One of the questions we asked was, well, how much integration do you have right now? Only 11% were fully integrated. But I'm pleased by that number because just a few years ago, it would have been one or two percent. 33% are totally independent. And one of the mantras of the security industry for years, for decades, has been the mantra is we want to be standalone. We don't want to be interconnected to anything. We want to have everything in our own. We control it. Nobody else can touch it. The problem with that is the world has changed. Almost, I'd say every camera, closed circuit TV camera you can buy on the market today is going to have IP uh, networking capabilities. You may not use it, but it's built into the camera when you take it out of the box. So the, the mantra of security being standalone, we don't want to be involved in anybody else, is not going to work anymore because you can't avoid being integrated. It's simply not possible. You can't do your job in security if you're not. Convergence also is important. Well, who has the status? IT has a three to one ratio over security in terms of status in the typical corporation. And by the way, when I say, when I'm using the word corporation, I'm not necessarily only talking about commercial. It could be any organization. It could be a governmental agency. These figures are relatively going to track about the same way, whether it's a private corporation or a public agency. Three to one. IT status. Now, that has implications I, I'm going to get back to, but it has significant implications for the future of IT and security. What are the relationships between the departments? 72% say they're cooperative. Well, that's great. But 10% say they have a difficult relationship. And let's make believe we're talking about Fortune 500 companies. That's 50 large corporations in the billion, multi-billion dollar operating, annual operating budget. It's 50 corporations where IT and security cannot work together for various reasons. 
That makes both their jobs very, very difficult. How often do IT and security people meet? 45% either don't ever meet or rarely meet. Can you expect cooperation? So we're talking about almost half the corporations have a poor relationship between IT and security. What kind of software are they using? Again, remember, the, the mantra for security for decades has been, we want to be standalone. We don't want to be involved. The software they use, 70% right now, is proprietary. The implication of that, of course, is if it's proprietary, it means that you might be married to a particular vendor for a long time. It might be cost prohibitive to change the software because uh, data gathering panels throughout your large office building or whatever, all would have to be changed. Uh, linkages would have to be changed. I mean, it, it gets to the point that you simply can't afford to change. Now, I'm, I'm optimistic that 30% is non-proprietary. They at least have open protocols. Some are open source, not too many, but most at least open protocols. So that's optimistic, and maybe this, this ratio will change over time. But right now, it's not conducive for good convergence. Question was asked, would facility security systems be affected if the IT network was infected by a virus? Well, 40-40 is interesting, but the most interesting one is 20% don't know. One out of five had no idea whether they'd be influenced or not. Is security a risk to IT? Well, Bill Zell, a friend of mine who writes for Security Magazine, different from security management, in his survey he found that 42% of IT managers believe that facility security systems represent a risk to their network. In other words, in the other direction. By tying security into the IT network, they have, they, at least almost a half of them said they have a vulnerability. And that's absolutely true. You have to understand the history of security systems, particularly software, systems management software, to understand why they think that. And I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. John. Yes, sir. Just so you know, the convergence of dealing with projectors creates a huge shadow vulnerability. <laughs> oh, am I? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> convergence, yes. Most major security systems management software was developed at a time when cyber attacks were either non-existent or it wasn't even a factor. Some of them go back to the uh, early 70s. You're talking about 40 years. And they're still out there. R&D is a very, very small, tiny, minuscule budget in most security vendor companies. Well, am I uh, making it difficult for you? No, too? no, I, 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 I thought to move the camera. Go ahead. If they're not spending on R&D, some of the, I'm not going to name names right now, but some of them have basically done no R&D. They tweak it a little bit, they do a lot of, they bootstrap stuff onto it, but it really hasn't changed in 30, 40 years. Some major security software has never had any protection against any kind of cyber defense. And like I said, some major security system software was cobbled together on their existing product after the fact has either that or has never been pen tested. They put it on, they don't know if it works. What kind of operating systems are typical then for both departments? Well, IT, well, both of them are predominantly Windows, obviously. IT tends to be 96% of the companies were Windows. 4% Unix, no Linux. Oddly, security is actually getting into uh, 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 Linux much more than uh, IT. What's the most hacked software in the world? Windows. Wrong. Windows is the most hacked software in the United States. On a worldwide basis, the most hacked software is Linux. We just don't happen to use Linux in the US very much except for like embedded applications and special applications, vending machines, Coke machines and so forth, that dial out and say, I need more Coke. 
The other thing here is primary operating systems. Four percent of the respondents didn't know what they had. That's telling too, which means you're relative. You mean four percent again of say 500 companies? That's a lot of companies who have no idea what operating software they're using. Are these guys just trying to Uh, not for operating system, uh, but yes, there is a, particularly on the security side, but, but here it, it really doesn't matter that much. Security departments vulnerability to attacks, 49 percent of their systems are periodically inspected by IT, but that means 50 percent are not. 50 percent, 7 percent stated their security system software was never designed against cyber threats. And 57% didn't even have the ability to know if their ports were being attacked or scanned. Of the very few security systems management software developer products that started when they wrote the code to begin with, they incorporated uh, IT, uh, cyber defense, they tend to be part of building automation systems. The downside of that, of course, is that security is a tiny component of the building automation system. It's not dominant. In fact, again, I don't, I don't want to name names yet, but, uh, but in some cases, if you want to balance the HVAC system in your building, sometimes you have to shut down the security system before you can do that, because it's part of the BAS. They also tend to be very expensive. In some cases, triple the, the cost or price of, of non-BAS uh, security management software, and they're not widely used at the present time. I was interested that we also asked the question, well, is, do you have a building automation system? About a third, almost a third said yes, two-thirds said no, and again, that strange 7%, I don't know. It's hard to believe you wouldn't know that. But. So this goes back to what I was starting out talking about. If we're talking about two IT professionals, the IT community, many believe they're security experts. With some exceptions, like I said, everybody in this room, most of them aren't, but they think they are. I, I remember that I've done hundreds of surveys of buildings and computer centers. And I remember this infamous one in, uh, in New Jersey I went to, where they were so proud of what they had, they had spent a big bundle, a big bundle of money on security systems and cameras and intrusion sensors <clears throat> for their computer room. And I'm walking down the hall and I saw a utility closet, a janitor's closet, and they opened up the janitor's closet and there's a suspended ceiling in there. So I got a ladder, I climbed up, and yeah, you could climb right over the wall like I think someone did here earlier this morning. <laughs> You could go right inside. I, and I said, you have an intrusion sensors above the ceiling? No, they didn't. Because they can't think like criminals. Criminals would think of that. Ordinary people don't. Ordinary people are stymied by a locked door. Right? But that's the mentality. Some IT departments hold a dominant position over security departments. I'll get back to that again a little more later. But there's an increasing trend that IT is actually managing the security of both private and public organizations. Why? Because a lot of security is IT-based. And the security people are not well, well versed and they're turning more into company cops. And the actual management is being done by the IT department, which doesn't think like criminals. They don't have the mindset to do this effectively. The other aspect of this that I think influences vulnerabilities in both communities is that chief technology officers a lot of times have direct access to senior management. Security managers generally don't have that kind of access. Some IT professionals dislike, maybe even hate, traditional security and security professionals. There's an actual animosity. And in some cases, they ignore, circumvent, and even sabotage non-IT security systems. 
and security practitioners are held in low esteem because they're, the fact of the matter is IT people tend to be better educated. They tend to have more professional careers. A lot of security people come out of law enforcement, may not, in other words, might have a ton of experience, but don't have a lot of education compared to IT. And some IT departments resist integration into facility-wide security systems or having those systems integrated with them. The problem is when they do their own, they typically are poorly designed and poorly managed. And that's why, I, again, I stake my reputation on the fact that the vast majority of IT departments and so forth have poor security, and, but they think they're doing a really good job. It's only when you pen test them that, that and then of course, <laughs> sometimes I remember one, uh, yeah, uh, I, I try to keep those, those, it, those uh, projects very, very confidential for obvious reasons. But I remember this one very, very sensitive facility asked if, if, if I and, and some other people working with me, we could break into their facility uh, over a weekend, starting Friday night until Monday morning when people come to work. And their, their statement was, of course, we know you can't do it. We just want to see how far you can get before we catch you. Well, Friday night by 8 p.m., we had gone in three times. <laughs> so I had two days, and they were funded days, so. So I remember I, I called a local airport and had a hazmat suit delivered to me, because I never tried that, to see how, how a hazmat suit. I had theatrical smoke delivered. So for two days, I got, I got to play all kinds of crap that I, I always wanted to try. <laughs> and they gave me the money to do it, so. <laughs> and then, after I did it, they did not want to report. <laughs> Nothing in writing, they said. And they paid us everything that uh, go away. <laughs> so. All right, who reports to whom? Again, it shows the status that IT has that's significantly higher than security. IT departments, 27% CEO, 26 CFO, 18% CEO, you can add those up, and you're talking about very senior management access. On the security side, about half or a third of that. 73% of IT departments report to senior management, only 40% of security departments do. What titles? Now, a lot of times you can find out what someone's status is by what they're allowed to call themselves. Again, uh, IT is much higher, uh, particularly CISO, CTO, and CIO. On the security side, most of them tend to be called director of security. And director, of course, is a non, depending on how you look at it, is a, is a non title term, you know, same as manager. Now, this is kind of fun. I wanted to get a sense of, because the questionnaires that we got back were, were filled out by both security and IT people, and we really didn't have a good a sense of the, what the mix was. In other words, how many IT people did they collaborate to do it independently? So I wanted to get a sense of how much I knew about IT, so I asked, I said, and I didn't have the, uh, those little parentheses weren't there. I just said, do you know what ISO is? Do you know what it stands for? Yes or no? So 75% knew what ISO was, International Organization for Standards. 46% Six Sigma quality control and so forth and all the way down. When it gets down to like building automation systems, remember that a lot of them had building, a third had building automation systems. Only 5% had ever heard of BACnet. You can't be in the BAS if you don't know BACnet. And then my concern was, suppose someone's BSing me, saying, yeah, yeah, I know what that is. Well, so I asked them, do you know Klaatu? Of the 100 questionnaires, no one said they recognized Klaatu. And that was affirming to me, because Klaatu was a nonsense term from the movie The Day the Earth Stood Still, Klaatu Barada Nikto, right? <laughs> Had this been higher than zero, then I would know somebody's BSing me, but nobody said they recognized Klaatu. So I think it was a relatively honest survey, at least as far as we could make it. 
part of the issue is your organization tends to be part of the problem. According to Absolute Software and Ponemon Institute, uh, last year in February, 56% of business managers disengaged their laptop encryption. 92% of IT departments report that a laptop has been lost or stolen, of which 71% resulted in data breaches. And 61% of business managers share their passwords, whereas only 4% of IT managers do. So the organization is part of the vulnerability too. So when you're talking about convergence, about security departments and IT departments melding together at some point, you can't ignore the larger organization because those employees and those managers are part of the problem and part of the vulnerability that's created as well. Of the 329 organizations queried, 86,000 laptops were stolen over a one-year period. The average cost per organization, average cost per organization, $6.4 million. And where did that cost come from? The value of the intellectual property stolen obviously is part of it. There's also fees associated with data breaches, and that is you have to go out and you have to get people to come in and, and figure out, do a damage control, damage assessment, what was lost. And there are certain, depending on, your, on, on who you are, like you have DEA requirements and so forth, there are no, mandatory notification requirements for data breaches as well. The probability of any laptop being lost or stolen in any three-year period is 5 to 10 percent. And only 5 percent of the laptops that are stolen are ever recovered. Now that's, again, a convergence vulnerability. That's because IT is not really good at security. They don't think that way. And security is rarely involved in helping them protect things like laptops. Because they tend, IT tends to operate independently. 46% of the laptops contain sensitive information. Only 30% had disk-based encryption. Only 29% had been imaged for backup. And only 10% included any kind of anti-theft features at all. No questions or challenges or comments? <laughs> All right, this is interesting, particularly those who are not undercover here. Internet sales. This is a convergence area that a lot of people don't think about. But the availability of, of the Internet and Internet access means that you can buy stuff and sell stuff in relative anonymity. In other words, you don't have to walk into a store. No one can ask for your credentials over the internet. That, uh, you, you can lie about it. In 2005, not that years ago, customs inspectors intercepted a package of badges from Taiwan to an apartment in Bronx, New York. The shipping contained 1,000 badges. Man, you can read the rest. <clears throat> Search of the residence revealed a 1,300 high quality counterfeit law enforcement badges in the residence. And by the way, this was a legitimate business enterprise. This was nothing nefarious. It was open to board, and this person that actually had this stuff was actually selling primarily to law enforcement agencies. But part of it was FBI badges. And the irony here is, I don't know how well you can see it, the way you find out which one's counterfeit, it's the better looking badge. <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of stuff, as well as paraphernalia used for break-ins, red hat operations and so forth, hacking tools, uh, O-days, all that stuff is conceivably available anonymously over the internet. That is a convergence issue of a major kind. Other aspects, like, uh, in fact, I was chatting this morning about a week, uh, just a week ago, I, uh, I played back a TiVo recording of uh, CSI New York, one of my favorite shows. And they had a segment where uh, robbers were coming in and they were wearing infrared LED uh, collars around their head. And they gave this effect. You could see the body, you could see the figure, but you couldn't see the face because it was blue bloomed out. Now, 
and, and, and it's a German company that sells it, that the device is on the right. I'm dubious about whether this really works. It could be mythology. Uh, I've been looking into it for the last couple of days with no success. I'm not making any headway on that. In fact, I tweeted and I, I went on LinkedIn and everybody else, and so far nobody's come back with any useful support. I want to know, has anybody actually benched or lab tested this technology? I have a feeling, I mean, I got two problems with it. One is that infrared energy, any monochrome camera can see into the ultraviolet and the near infrared spectrum, particularly around 700 nanometers, and up to about 1,000 nanometers, it drops off. All monochrome cameras have what's called a cut IR filter because uh, the wavelengths are different. There's, you create focusing problems by allowing too much IR. Not only that, but you have a balance of adjustment problems. Um, so the cut filter should, should block a lot of the IR unless someone's, you know, why would anybody take the cut filter out? Wouldn't make any sense, uh, particularly for a monochrome camera. Uh, the other problem is that I don't want to get too, I don't know how technically it would, but <clears throat> human beings run about 2.7 microns wavelength via our energy. Uh, I'm sorry, 9 to 12 microns. Ordinary glass, silicon dioxide. You put glass in front of a passive infrared sensor or any infrared source, it'll block infrared energy beyond 2.7 microns which means you put glass in front of an IR sensor, it can't see a human being, and yet you, do, you don't get a trouble light or anything like that because it's still working. It just simply can't see that part of the spectrum. And since the glass on the lens on the camera is, is glass, anyway. But on the other hand, maybe this is a vulnerability. But again, this is a convergence issue. issue. Yes, sir? I used to use CCD cameras, like the standard cameras you get at Best Buy, to find IR illuminators. So yep. you, can, you can see with the camera the IR illuminations, you can't see with your eyes. Yeah, and, and what's interesting to me is, in fact, I, somebody was tweeting with me uh, just a day or so ago about that. It's fascinating to me because some of this, they, they, they brought this up to me as if this is new technology. And I pointed out that over 30 years ago, there is a U.S. Customs in particular, and uh, back then called BNDD, Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, had something called a firefly. And there was a little tiny uh, IR uh, LED transmitter, battery power. You could barely see it. And they put it on a piece of cargo or a car they wanted to track. And then they got in the helicopter and put on uh, IR uh, night vision goggles. And you could be five miles away and this thing looked like explosions. So you just, to follow a car or, a, or a cargo being moved, you just follow the explosions from a helicopter at a height of, you know, 1,200 feet. That's 30, 35 years ago. So the stuff we have today is frankly not that different. I mean, it's firefly technology. Yes, sir? We just tested it and uh, you, it doesn't blind the camera, though you can tell the LEDs on a lot easier than if you just look at the bare human eyes. Yeah, my, my concern about this is, and why I'm dubious, is that, I, that LEDs in particular, because you have a bunch of them on there, uh, tend to be very directional. Yeah, Unless you've got a Fresno thing. lens. So, so my thinking is if you just turn your head a little bit and you change your orientation, your face shows up. Though something that does work, and I've seen someone actually do this with a scope and like a, a cell phone to turn it on and off. Aim with a scope, a green laser into yeah. a camera, then trigger it using the cell phone and you can temporarily blind the camera for the amount of time you need it. Yeah, yeah. In fact, in, in the movie Sneakers, we were going to actually... Uh, we wrote that scene, but he never got, never made final production. Didn't it? It oh. made it in, um, uh, shoot, what's his name? Um, the, uh, uh, um, uh, who's the guy that directed Malcolm X? He also directed that bank robber movie. Um, Spike Lee. Spike, Spike Lee, Lee, yeah. Spike Lee's movie about the bank robber. Yeah. Um, the, when they came in, they had some kind of equipment that they aimed at. It seemed like that was kind of simulating the scene. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, it, but this thing is not to blind a camera, but it simply puts so much IR around your face that you can't, can't be recognized. But anyway, it's a convergence issue. People see it as a technology breakthrough. I look at it as convergence. It's IT and security coming together to either create a solution or create a problem. Then photoshopping, like I did earlier. 
it creates all kinds of vulnerabilities. That is, the IT capability of doing photoshopping and security requirements for good credentials is so easy to phony up credentials right now. This is one I did myself. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> it was easy to move everything around. And of course, part of the training that security ought to get from IT people is how do you recognize bad credentials? Because they're so easy to do right now. Are you going to talk about convergence like in passports with IT and security? They, uh... Actually, Tiffany has a whole thing on RFID and the U.S. passports that uh, she could, if we have time, she could get into. She has a whole little presentation on that. But the notion that, uh, that uh, RFID credentials, including passports, are not vulnerable to uh, uh, hacking is, is BS. It's already been demonstrated. In fact, I think Black Hat had a demonstration. And then another critical convergence issue is the internal threat. What happens if you're on the inside, whether you're on the security side or the IT side? FBI, for example, had its own problem, so did the CIA. And the access to the internet and IT technology just makes the insider threat so much more dangerous. One of the big questions I have about Manly, for example, in this WikiLeak business, is what the heck was wrong with their system? Back in, uh, again, decades ago when I was at the CIA, everybody, if they could, had to spend some time in what we used to call purgatory, and that is you had to spend some time in the records area so you understand what they have and how it works and what's, you know, what was reasonably requested. And everybody down there, uh, we were warned, I mean, don't check out your neighbors, don't check out your relatives, don't check out your girlfriend or boyfriend, because they'd pick you up right away. Now, how the heck did Manley get 500,000 to, what, 2 million documents? And nobody said, wait a minute, why is one man requesting 2 million documents, downloading them? I don't understand. Where were the checks and balances? Not only that, but that should be something so easy to follow. So, so what's the best way to mitigate vulnerabilities caused by employee misconduct? Well, there's certainly the answer is better cooperation between security and IT departments. And one way you get better cooperation is you get them to talk to each other. Have regular meetings. Cross-train. Take security people and bring them into the IT world and give them IT, some IT training. Take IT people and bring them into the security world. Have them go through a few ASIS conferences or whatever. Cross-train them. Security awareness training. A lot of times, like for example, bad credentials. If you know about bad credentials, if you're alerted to it that there might be counterfeit FBI badges floating around there, and you know what they look like, you can, you can discover it, but the, it starts with awareness. And then general security education. But finally, I think the part of the solution is the enforcement of rules and standard operating procedures. Enforcement. But to quote, to paraphrase Al Capone, you can accomplish more with security awareness training and benevolent despotism than you can with security awareness training. What Al Capone says, you can accomplish more with a kind word and a gun than you can with a kind word. So it's the same idea. <laughs> Enforcement. I mean, uh, right now, if you, if you break the rules and violate the rules, there are virtually no consequences most of the time. We're undergoing a sea change in security, both IT security and traditional security. Certainly the World Trade Center attacks in 1993-2001 created that, to some extent, the Murrah Building in Oklahoma City. The birth of Homeland Security, it's a juggernaut. Uh, I think they could do a lot better, but considering how little time they had and how it was rammed through, on the one hand, I can admire that they've accomplished so much, but they have a long way to go yet. Security systems, <clears throat> have been immersed in IT, that is, when you talk about electronic security systems today, you're talking about basically cyber type of technology. Uh, security sensors now are intelligent, have artificial intelligence, 
A lot of times use fuzzy logic. Uh, that is non-digital cyber thinking. In other words, it's not a yes or no, it's a probability saying, I, I, I'm about 98% sure that there's been an intrusion. Whereas in the old days, it was either 100 or a zero. And that made it a lot easier for the hacker, for the attacker. When I'd red team something, I'd, I would attack the circuit that was designed to minimize nuisance and false alarms. That was my first priority. If you're going to attack, for example, a fence intrusion system, and I say this because there's only one good one in the world, probably, and that's Israeli tall wire, but all these others, they're meant to create a window of alarm opportunity. Lasting about 50 seconds to about 90 seconds, depending on the system. Which means that if you have an outdoor fence system and you have a lot of wind, or you have deer moving around, grazing on, on shrubs next to the fence, and they set off the alarm, the system checks again. All right, am I, am I going to get another signal, another signal, another signal? If at some point after 90 seconds, 45 to 90 seconds, it doesn't get a signal, it says, okay, I'd probably, probably nothing. So if I go out there with bolt cutters and I cut a link in a chain link fence that has an intrusion sensor on it, but I only make a cut every 95 seconds, I'm not going to set off the alarm. And I could cut a hole the size enough to send a regiment through, as long as each cut is 90 seconds, 95 seconds apart. So that's the part of the system that's vulnerable, and we can fix that. And one way we fix that is using intelligent video, artificial intelligence, and particularly fuzzy logic. Japan established a fuzzy logic institute about 20 years ago. We have, we, most people in our community, in the U.S., we don't even know what fuzzy logic is. You need to beef that up. Mega corporations have entered into security. I'm talking about Fortune 100 companies. Finally discovered there's a market there and they can make a lot of money. That's changing, that's a sea change for security because they're finally putting in R&D dollars, whereas small companies couldn't afford it, these huge corporations can. It's a little bit like, you know who invented the transistor that revolutionized the world? What company invented the transistor? Exactly, Bell Labs, PNP, NPN. These guys worked at the Homer Research Center in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Worked for Bell Labs, and Bell, Ma Bell back those, those days had all the money in the world. And Ma Bell said, here, there's a bunch of money. Do whatever you want, there's no agenda, you don't have to report anything, pick your own project. And they ended up inventing the transistor. Global war on terror has changed security and, and particularly has a tremendous impact on convergence. A renewed growth of public law enforcement, I'll get back to that in a minute. That's a very significant one that everybody overlooks. 9-11 changed law enforcement. Trial lawyers discovered security. That changed security. All of a sudden, liability exposure is a factor, both for the IT and the security side. Uh, the 1993 attack in the World Trade Center with the last litigation was only finished about a year and a half ago, resulting in billions of dollars in awards and in the cost of security. We have to be smarter in security. You can read the headline yourself. <laughs> New Jersey officials fear terrorists could poison gumball machines. That is not where we want to spend our <laughs> homeland defense money. Or I remember I blogged a little bit about Senator Collins from Maine. I, half the time I spent half my time in Maine. She directed Homeland Security money sent up to Fort Kent. Those from not from Maine don't know where Fort Kent is. Fort Kent is on a Canadian border. Al-Qaeda couldn't find Fort Kent with a map. <laughs> I don't think their security department needs anti-terrorism paraphernalia. So we just have to be smarter. What are the costs? Well, I, nobody knows. Costs are overlapping. They're stuck in odd budgets. If you look at a construction project, you rarely will find a line item for security systems. It will be part of electrical, some will be in, H, in HVAC, some will be in infrastructure. 
costs overlap. State and <coughs> homeland security uh, costs a lot of times are not captured deliberately sometimes. Security spending is poorly defined. Is a fence a security item or a line of legal demarcation? Is a fence a security purchase? It's worthless in terms of intrusion. I don't care what kind of fence you make and get over it in seconds. So it's a line of legal demarcation as far as I'm concerned. There's not very little security value. But what budget are you going to find it in? Don't know. Overseas figures are almost entirely missing. And for liability reasons, again, trial attorneys have discovered security. Most companies and governmental agencies don't want to talk about problems because of liability exposure. 1989, 1990, we, I, me and two of the guys, we published a book, Private Security Trends, projecting a 30-year period from 1970 to 2000, what our forecast was, what we think security is going to go. Um, we need something, uh, we need a new study, because we have no idea what the costs are right now. Our figure back then was, by the way, the entire, I'm talking about, nobody had done a study like this before. And when we found out that private security became bigger and more expensive than public law enforcement in 1977, that was basically a shock to everybody. Nobody knew that. And then it kept diverging, where almost private security by 2000 was more than two times the size of public law enforcement. But 9-11 happened and all those other factors I talked about. Well, I don't know what the costs are, but we, I think this is what happened. I think public law enforcement is above private security again. So what's included in those numbers? Are we talking law enforcement include intelligence? Does private security include yes. company IT departments? The only thing that was not included was overseas. So what, what is included, not what's not included? Uh, public law enforcement was uh, state, federal, and local law enforcement, okay. including corrections. Okay. And on the uh, uh, private side, it was corporate, mainly private, uh, corporate security. Whether it could be contract guard services or it could be proprietary guard services. But in any event, we th I think the crossover occurred. And now law enforcement, public law enforcement, is probably well over private security again. But we don't know. Somebody needs to do a, a new study. Some more thoughts. <clears throat> Typical office building today costs about $116,000 a square foot. An overseas diplomatic facility is now running about $450. It was up to about $700, but they've, done, they've cut it back finally. But the recent uh, visitor center for Congress came out to almost $1,000 a square foot. Huge difference. <clears throat> Let me talk just a minute about risk assessment, because it's been part of convergence, and that is What's the risk to the IT side? What's the risk to the security side? Well, this is my personal opinion. Oh, there may be those who disagree with me, but in my personal opinion, most structured risk assessment methodologies, a lot of times called RAMs, and I think all of them, have very limited value, and some of them are totally worthless, despite the fact that you could easily spend sixty dollars to $100,000 per assessment. One of the reasons is, that they're designed by academics who don't know anything about security. And one, again, I, I'm not going to name them so I don't get sued by them, but they, when you really look at it, and I, I got certified by them just so I could actually use it and train and so forth. When you really poke into it, you find out that they said probability of one, which means the most improbable thing you can imagine as far as the risk assessment methodology is concerned will happen. An asteroid hitting this building is as likely to happen as someone stealing my wallet if I leave it in my car. Makes no sense. How can you equate those two in probable events? And again, in my opinion, the best risk assessments, if you're going to do them, are subjective, not objective. And they ought to be done by an expert on a subjective basis, on a case-specific basis. A cookie-cutter approach where you try to say, here's an assessment for all office buildings. Wouldn't you say that a federal courthouse in South Dakota has a lower risk of a terrorist attack than a federal courthouse in Manhattan? 
And yet, as a nation today, we spend the same amount of money in both. We, we regard the risk as identical. Makes no sense to me. However, I'll tell you what the secret is. <laughs> That's the secret. Just a few minutes on understanding threats. Uh, and, and <clears throat> Kevin Mitnick popularized the term social engineering. Again, when I do uh, have done uh, uh, red team or black hat or whatever you want to call it, attacks, social engineering is the greatest vulnerability there is. That's the first place you look. Try to convince someone to break a rule. I remember the movie Sneakers when Redford's trying to get into the building. Uh, River Phoenix is delivering a whole pallet full of Drano and Redford's carrying a balloon and a cake and he can't get, because his hands are full, he can't get his wallet to get his ID card out. That's realistic. The Drano guy was to get, to get the security guard involved with something and Redford's yelling at him, so what he does, he lets him in the door. That's social engineering. It almost always involves getting someone to break a rule. And convergence, the problem with convergence, the lack of cooperation and conversation between IT and security, traditional security, is, is at the heart of this problem. Because if, if IT, for example, doesn't like facility security, it's easy to break their rules. They're not your rules. It's their rules you're breaking. You're keeping your rules. And that's what you exploit. Let's see if... Uh, Well, that doesn't work. <laughs> well, there's a sound file there, but anyway, it's from the sneakers. <laughs> anyway, wrapping that up then, conclusions. Security departments will be increasingly subordinated under IT over the coming decade. By 2020, my guess is at least 70% of the organizations will be fully integrated between security and IT. I think facility managers will have a growing role in security, and security managers per se, or security directors, will decline. They're already declining an average of 2% per year, organizationally across the board. Why facility managers? Because a facility manager runs everything in a building, from snow melt systems to HVAC to hot water to everything. And since security is part of it now, part of the building, built into it, building automation systems, they're going to be in charge of running it. And again, the security manager is going to become the company cop. Titles are going to increase like CTO and CSO. And security manufacturers, however, over the next decade, are retooling everything they have with IT and computer security in mind. So it will be no longer cobbled together, stuck on after the fact. They're reinventing their products, redesigning their products, and they're building cybersecurity right into it. Convergence will lead to more RFID applications. I think biometric access control is going to become commonplace. In fact, the likelihood that facial recognition, which is not ready for prime time yet, uh, you walk up to a building, the building sees you, recognizes you, and you walk in and knows you're there and knows when you leave. I think that's only a couple years away. We can do it right now, but the, the failure rate's about 2%. But if you're talking about thousands of people, 2% is too high. We, once it gets down to about like a tenth of a percent or half a percent, then, then, then it's going to be real. Long-range facial recognition is almost here. Uh, the resolution capability of cameras, megapixel cameras right now, we're up to, if you got the money, you can go up to 32 megapixels now on one camera. And the possibility of going to 100, maybe 200 megapixels is certainly possible in the near future. Video surveillance is already exploding. New York City, nobody knows exactly, but they probably have a neighborhood of 12,000 cameras networked right now. London's been doing this for a number of years already. More artificial intelligence and greater use of the internet for non in other words, if you have a camera looking at a door, why should I spend company or government resources on some kind of private WAN or LAN 
when I can go to the internet because you saw it, suppose my neighbor taps into that camera. Who cares? It's looking at a blank door. Let them look at the door. At the same time, however, I can use them for surveillance. I remember I did a project in Hong Kong some time ago for what's called the Ocean uh, Pier, where they had, uh, Hong Kong never had, uh, back then at least, never had a lot of crime, but a lot of petty stuff, you know, uh, purse snatches and things like that. And, and so what we did, we put cameras all over the shopping mall and then remodulated all the TVs in an expensive apartment building that was part of the uh, mall complex. So elderly people who had nothing else to do could turn on a specific channel and they would see all the security cameras on the pier. And sometimes like Queen Mary arrived and they could see celebrities coming off. But other times they'd see, hey, that kid's doing something. They'd get on the phone, they'd call the cops, Hong Kong police, and they intercept them. And that's free security, you don't have to pay for it. And not only that, they loved it. So. I think the IT community will lead writing convergence standards. And if the US doesn't start changing its ways, it's, the European Union is going to dominate writing those standards. It is dominating right now. I'm not saying we're not involved, but we're not involved as clearly the EU is way ahead of us in writing standards. I think security will be finally incorporated into building codes. There are about three governing, national governing building codes in America that, and when you say building code, you translate that. 90% of all building codes are fire codes, fire life safety codes. You don't really write codes about how to build something. It's fire stuff. But none of them really have any meaningful security invo uh, involvement. That's going to change. And stuff that's going to disappear, print newspapers, paper checks, CRTs, pay phones, paper maps, pennies, iPods, desktop computers, VCRs, card readers, incandescent light bulbs, supermarket checkout lines, car keys will all disappear over the next 10 years. Almost, maybe entirely or almost entirely. And the final point. <laughs> and that's the presentation. Thank you. I didn't get to use my laser pointer. You can find a camera with it.